churches. Let's send your students to college. The United Methodist Higher Education Foundation's UM Dollars for Scholars program matches church-sponsored scholarships to create awards worth up to $4,000. Learn more about this exciting program at umhef.org. The king is dead. Long live the king. This seemingly contradictory proclamation is used in some countries with monarchies to announce the death of one royal and the ascension of the next to the throne. The idea is to communicate continuity. The death of the king doesn't mean the end of the monarchy. It just takes a new form, specifically a new person serving as king. This phrase is used or adapted to speak to other shifts in which the details may change, but an underlying principle remains the same. And so to open today's MyCom Church Marketing Podcast, I hereby declare the written word is dead. Long live the written word. Thank you to everybody for listening. My name is Dan Wonderlich. I'm a United Methodist pastor. And remember blogs? Uh, Did you have one? I had one. (laughs) Do you still have one? I guess since mine is still up on my website, I technically still have one, but being transparent, I haven't posted to it in about five years. That coincides with the birth of my first child and my return to local church ministry after a season in extension ministry, so I had many excuses for it to go dormant, but I also have not really seen a reason to bring it back. I used to blog about worship creativity, and communication, and included things like church communications, preaching, and I made free graphics from time to time for various seasons and events to entice people to sign up for my email list. (laughs) Some of you may very well have done that. Using a blog in this way is employing what's called content marketing. This is where you prepare or curate helpful content or resources, giving it away for free in order to build credibility and connection. People who engage with and benefit from your content come to see you as someone who's helpful and trustworthy, and that earns you the right to ask for something, whether that's the permission to email them regularly or even to offer something for sale. We've talked about this strategy on the podcast many times before, most recently this summer with graphic designer Will Patterson. He started filming YouTube videos to teach tricks he was learning in Photoshop and Illustrator. His videos genuinely helped viewers learn something, but they also happened to feature his work, and soon he found people wanting to hire him. One of the reasons I gave up blogging is not that I lost interest in the topics I was focusing on or lost interest in helping others grow in these areas. I still think and write and teach and coach in these areas. The ideas are still there, but the delivery method has changed. In fact, you're listening to one of those delivery methods right now. Between podcasting, social media posts, video, and even the occasional online workshop, I'm still active in this space, just not on my blog. I'll see more impressions in a few days on a vertical video that follows the format we talked about earlier this summer than I'll see on a blog post over a few months. And now I'm going to guess that your church likely doesn't have an active blog or hasn't had one for a while. Or if you actually still do, it's probably a written summary of the sermon or the equivalent of the pastor's note that used to be on the front of the church newsletters that got mailed to everybody. You remember those? So it probably is not that controversial to declare, for the most part, the blog is dead. But with the outsized focus on vertical video across social media, the rise in audio content like podcasts and audiobooks, the decline in attention spans, and the dramatic shift away from desktops and laptops toward doing everything on mobile devices, we might even go so far as to declare that the written word is dead. For some of us, that might be no big deal. We like these other formats. They might even be quicker and easier. And maybe you didn't write that much to begin with. Maybe a little copy for your church website, captions for social media. If you're a pastor or a small group leader, you had your sermons or your lessons. But for others of us, writing is important to us. It's how we best organize our thoughts and express ourselves. 
It's where we can communicate with depth and nuance. We don't have to quote unquote perform, whether it's via video or audio, or we recognize from our own experience or the experience of a friend or loved one that reading the written word is how some people best learn. Sometimes I don't want to scrub through a YouTube video. I'd like to skim a blog post. And I know that I have some favorite writers that inspire me to want to write. So is the written word dead? Well, to quote college game day co-host Lee Corso here at the beginning of the college football season, not so fast, my friend. It's not that the written word is dead, but the way we are used to encountering the written word, that has changed. So let's talk through how we might continue or revive the use of the written word in our church communications. First, one of the main reasons traditional blogging has all but died relates to discovery and delivery. How did you used to interact with blogs? Maybe you bookmarked the blog and came back to it regularly. Maybe you clicked a link to a post you saw on social media. Maybe a friend emailed a post to you, or maybe you used a feed reader, which is almost like an email program specifically for blogs. Some of those even had what we would now call a discover tab, where it would recommend posts from blogs you didn't subscribe to, but they thought you might like. It becomes a one-stop shop for discovery and delivery. Well, uh, feed readers aren't really a thing anymore. You likely aren't cycling through a bunch of bookmarks on your phone or your tablet, and unless the headline really grabs you, you're probably not clicking on links on social media platforms either. You know, those algorithms on the social networks, they're designed to keep you there, not send you somewhere else. And so unless a link is generating a ton of engagement, and it, it uh, you know, it just isn't getting as much organic reach as things like vertical video are today. Add to it the fact that many people scrolling social media are not looking for something to read, at least not of any significant length. They're probably scrolling it in line or sadly at a red light. Now, email is still a thing, but we'll come back to that a little later. So what about Google? I mean, we could just figure out SEO, right? Search engine optimization, and that'll help us show up in search results. And then people will find uh, their way to our blog or our other written resource, right? Well, maybe. My dormant blog has a few posts that still perform very well thanks to search engine traffic, but it's not really the result of a deep intentional SEO strategy. You know, maybe we can do an episode on SEO in the future, but it can get complex very quickly. You can find yourself spending as much or more time on optimizing the piece of content as you did writing it. And this is in part due to the variable that comes up regularly in our discussions, and that's competition. We talk a lot about the overwhelming amount of content on social media that you're up against. Well, in the world of the written word on the internet, it's even worse. If the things you're publishing are broad and aimed at a general audience, which intentionally are not things like pastor blog posts, sermon summaries, and devotionals, those tend to be quite broad. Well, good luck showing up on the 10th page of search results, much less the first page. So I'm saying there's nothing we can do, right? We can all just happily write and post into the void and just hope and pray that some miracle will happen someday. Of course not. That's not why you tune into this podcast. What I am saying, though, is that if you're going to try to make an impact with your writing in late 2023 and early 2024, don't do it the way we did it in 2003 and 2004. And now let's take a brief pause to hear a word from our sponsor. Some folks in your church will get excited to give generously by seeing a well-prepared spreadsheet of the budget. However, for many of us, it's a well-told story, engaging images and graphics that communicate visually. A great tool to inspire those folks is with a narrative budget. More and more churches are using them to give a quick impression of how the church is working well to achieve its mission. Discipleship Ministries is excited to announce the return of a popular online course for local church leaders, Creating a Narrative Budget, the story behind the numbers. Through eight self-paced sessions, participants will learn generosity theory as well as the practical nuts and bolts of constructing a narrative budget. To learn more about this course and to register, go to www. Dot umcdiscipleship.org forward slash narrative budget. And now back to our program. 
the first main decision I think you need to make is to define the goal of your writing. Are you there to help someone learn something or do something? Or are you there to help someone feel a certain way? Are you there to challenge or entertain? Are you the voice of a guide or the voice of the person walking alongside the reader? It is, of course, totally possible to do many, if not all, of these things within a single post or across posts within a blog, but clarity and consistency in online writing is essential. There are very few people who, on the strength of their personality or communication style, can basically just talk or write about whatever's on their mind and have a whole community of people just love it all. Even those who seem like this is their approach are doing far more strategic curation behind the scenes than most of us can detect. I guarantee that. So what does it mean? It means that you need to pick a goal with your writing and focus on that goal. The more specific you can be with your goal, the more likely you are to be found. Going back to my old blog, my goal was to help encourage and resource people like you. What do pastors and church communications people at United Methodist Churches and other similar churches need most? Well, apparently, it was free graphics, help with finding decent free or affordable fonts, and prayers or responsive readings for very specific liturgical days. Those are the posts still generating traffic after five plus years of posting nothing new. Now, this takes discipline. But this kind of focus and discipline, that's what builds connection and trust. With every helpful post or resource, you are earning permission to ask for their attention again. This kind of discipline can also actually help you start to show up in search results. Kevin Kelly, the former founding editor of Wired Magazine, is famous for saying, don't aim to be the best, be the only. When you Google Laity Sunday Responsive Reading, My blog shows up first, even ahead of UM Discipleship. No offense, guys. Appreciate your work. Now, again, this was more blind luck than strategy, but looking back on it, it does make sense. You know, hindsight is 2020. Plenty of United Methodist churches have traditional services. Churches with traditional services tend to be more likely to celebrate niche special Sundays like Laity Sunday, and traditional services need traditional worship elements like responsive readings. I happen to solve a problem, and Google has rewarded me for it. So how does all of this translate to church marketing? Ask yourself what problems your community or a specific segment of your community faces and write to them, specifically to them. If you want to encourage parents of young children, don't just write about parenting. Write about parenting in your town, your city, or your region. The posts can still largely be universally applicable, but speak directly to them and when possible, include things that are specific to your local area. Title your posts with the kind of questions or phrases people would type into Google to find the kind of answers you're providing. Organize your writing with clear section titles. This helps people read quicker, which may sound like a bad thing, right? We don't want people skimming our amazing writing, but it actually feels more helpful to the reader. And if your writing is on a blog or web page, put those section titles in the H2 or H3 format. That'll help Google better understand and index your post. Now, what if your writing style isn't that quote unquote practical? What if you're more of a storyteller or inspirational writer? What if your goal is to make people think or feel something or wrestle with something more than it is to inform or teach? You're likely going to need to look outside of the search engine and more into the social engine. This kind of writing is more artistic. So how is art shared? You likely didn't go looking for your new favorite band on Google. You were exposed to them somewhere. You experienced the song or the painting or the poem, and it made you want to find more. This is where sharing portions of your writing on social media with links to bigger pieces or longer pieces becomes important. It may also mean getting in front of a camera and reading some writing in the vertical video format. Think the sermon clip that points to the larger message. For all forms of writing, though, there is another step that is highly recommended, and that is to find a way into people's email inboxes. The blog as a regularly visited and read resource may be dead or dying, but the email newsletter is thriving. 
You can run your own email list through your church database or an email platform like MailChimp, or you can use more robust newsletter platforms like Substack. The reason this is so important is that for the most part, email is immune to things like algorithm changes. Now is the time to focus on vertical video on social media, but it wasn't that way two years ago, and it may not be that way two years from now. Two years ago, our posts reached more of the people who said they wanted to see our stuff by liking or following our accounts. And today, it's actually harder to reach our own audience, yet easier to reach people who don't follow us thanks to discovery algorithms. But I am confident in saying that for the foreseeable future, we can use email to reach people who want to be reached and serve them in a way that builds connection and trust. So let's sum it all up. In a world with more noise, more distractions, and what feels like an overwhelming bent toward video, audio, and the kind of writing that's focused solely on brevity and creating an immediate emotional reaction, is there still a place for writing that goes a bit deeper? Yes, there is. It just looks different than it did, and it may call us to use formats or focus in a way we didn't have to in the past. We can point people to Jesus, including through connecting with our church, if we seek first to serve. We serve with our writing, but we also serve by understanding the way in which people seek and find answers in today's world. Now, before we close, I want to take a quick personal moment to thank our amazing producer, Josh, as he transitions to a new job this month. Josh puts in as much, if not more, work into each episode than I do. It may be my voice that you hear, but this is a team effort, and it has been a privilege to serve you all alongside Josh. Josh, we all wish you the best in your new ventures. For those of you listening along in real time, we are working on a plan for the podcast moving forward. There may be a short hiatus, but either way, don't worry, we'll be back. Until then, listeners, we want to hear from you. How do you discover and engage the written word in your own life? And how might you use the answers to those questions to shape how you share your own writing? Email us at podcast at umcom.org, and we just might share your thoughts or stories on a future episode. And you can, of course, use that email, podcast at umcom.org, to send us any feedback or topic suggestions you have for the show. We always love hearing from you. As always, the easiest way to support the show and to help other church communicators like yourself find it is by sharing this episode with your friends and colleagues and by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to us right now. And did you know that United Methodist Communications has celebrated over 80 years of ministry? Your support ensures that the latest denominational news, dynamic stories, and informative articles will continue to connect our global community. Make a tax-deductible donation today at resourceumc.org slash giveumcom. Thanks again for listening to the MyCom Church Marketing Podcast. Churches, let's send your students to college. The United Methodist Higher Education Foundation's UM Dollars for Scholars program begins with a $1,000 scholarship from a student's United Methodist Church, then applies matching from our foundation plus participating UM-related schools and UM conference foundations. The award total can reach up to $4,000. Learn more about this exciting scholarship program today. Visit umhef.com dot org.